Hi, right, y'all. Uh, in this talk, I will be presenting a series of related ideas about the mind, the internet, society, and our present and collective possibilities. It's going to be a lot of big ideas, but it comes down to this. We are making a mistake by othering new forms of intelligence, and we are creating a self-fulfilling prophecy to set them up as our replacements or adversaries. Our own present tells us there are alternative relationships to machines that can work. This story will touch on our economic systems, epistemology, Planet of the Apes, abstract Wikipedia, and yes, even the dread Elon Musk. Um, even if you don't get every digression or reference, I hope you will come away not accepting of these ideas, but as part of a world that includes them as a possibility. I'm not here to try to convince anyone, but just to reframe a bunch of ideas to see what else we can think of. Just consider, by thinking the default way about artificial intelligence in the mind, what are you missing out on? By considering machines as kin, automation as liberating, and hybridized intelligence as wonderfully and acceptably diverse, I believe we can create the social conditions for a better future for all humans, life, and machines on our spaceship Earth. We don't have to prove AI is smarter or sentient if we can rather accept that it is similar but different. It is of a kind, a kind of machine, not artificial intelligence. I believe this reframing is key to our future and to, as Buckminster Fuller called it, our humanity's option for success. I know it's not a story everyone can believe, but I hope it will, at minimum, inspire your curiosity and give you something to think about. So let's start with a basic question that underlies a lot of conversations about AI and sentience and so on. Can machines think? There are a wide array of philosophical answers to those questions, but to launch our exploration, I'm going to use Noam Chomsky's analogy in a way he'd horribly disapprove of. Do machines, do submarines swim? Before you say, of course not, think about it for a minute. Swimming is basically moving through the water under your own power. We predefine it to apply only to animate creatures, but we could easily imagine a language where the same verb is used for both natural and artificial locomotion through the water. So what if we simply look at the behavior of intelligent machines and decide without recourse to a priori, a priori categorization that they are artificial, whether what they do looks like thought, cognition, intelligence, and other mental functions? What if intelligence is not a singular phenomenon at all, but a class of widely varying ones? So the answer to the question of do machines think is, not yes or no, but in some ways. <clears throat> if we are willing to understand these as essentially arbitrary but in fact categories within our language, we can look at what they might imply. For Noam, it is pointless to argue about whether machines think, because thinking is, for him, definitionally the mental activity of humans. Or in Noam Chomsky's own words, uh, thinking is a human feature. Will AI someday really think? That's like asking if submarines will swim. If you call it swimming, then yes, robots will think. So let's be pragmatic instead about this question. Let us accept the position that artificial intelligence is categorically, fundamentally, by definition, not like us human normal people. It is inhuman, it is other. Stepping past the factualness of this premise, instead look at its implications. Really, this simple common sense position brings actually pretty scary and threatening implications for our present and future. This artificial other is under our control for now, but it is coming for all of us. It is fundamentally not like us, and it will replace the life you know and love with a degenerate existence of phone-dependent numbskulls and machines. This is the effect of othering, a masculine control to conserve a story that embeds in this, in this narrative. I can protect you, be afraid of these others, let me enslave and control them to preserve our way of life. The only natural order these artificial beasts can understand is if I can dominate them. This is a terrible story. AI is smarter than headlines, humans scream. Watson wins our strategy and trivia games these days. GPT is going to write the next version of Wikipedia. GitHub's predictive coding is ruining your programming job. These are stories <clears throat> by general technologists uh, with a lot of <laughs> uh, motivation to tell you these stories. Meanwhile, smart people like Emily Bender, my grad uh, advisor, and Denny Radicetic of our own organization try to bring some realism and expertise to this PR narrative. But these technologies, while they are impressive and rich, are incomplete. The narrative is not completely baked in, and how we apply and relate to these emerging technologies is actually still up for grabs. Reframing machine intelligence as an acceptable diversity rather than a threatening replacement, we can resist these masculine domination fantasies and nightmares being sold to us by billionaires and their mass media pundits. Many now believe that automation is, automation is dehumanizing our future and that AI and robotics form an existential threat to humanity or our humanism or our spiritual well-being. In part, I think this is driven by the concern that this evolution will follow a pattern where the, the elites in our society accumulate the benefits of productivity to themselves 
and that this automation will further divide human experience and possibilities by class. At a point when liberal capitalism, when it was in a terrible depression and besieged by uh, ideologically from the left and right in the 30s, famous uh, economist, John, economist John Maynard Keynes saw past that to a world where capitalism had succeeded at increasing, increasing productivity to the point where the population's needs were satisfied. In a prophetic essay titled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, Keynes argued that in spite of its problems, a market economy would outperform any other system when it came to producing these basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, and transportation, for example. And that by the year 2030, we would be able to produce more than enough of these goods for everyone to have the basic needs, uh, their basic needs satisfied. So what do we do from there? His hope was that his grandchildren's generation, which would actually correspond to the millennials, would no longer be driven by the need for stuff and personal gain. He posited a new form of capitalism, which would focus attention on the provision of things that markets did not by nature do well at. Keynes predicted an expansion of government support for the arts, humanities, and the enhancement of the human condition. Quote, thus for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares and wants to occupy his leisure, which science and compound interest will have won for him, to live wisely and agreeably above all. <clears throat> Keynes' predictions about the per capita growth in GDP that he that they were putting us on track were actually roughly correct or even a little bit low. Uh, unfortunately, the social and political changes he believed would accompany it have not been so obviously forthcoming. Uh, in their book, Inventing the Future, Nick Schreinick and Alex Williams put forth a vision of a post-scarcity, post-capitalist society. Rather than fight technology and efficiency gains, the political left should embrace ideas like universal basic income, they argue, to provide a new positive vision of what our future could be. And whether their particular program or points are the ones to pursue, the larger story I would use their manifesto to make is that automation and deprivation are not implied by each other. To reach Keynes's vision of a society in which all basic needs are met, or the, in my view, the fully automated luxury space communism of Star Trek The Next Generation, we must rethink who we value and for what, and make changes to our technologies to advance new values. We are right to worry that the existing masters of the universe will live in a perfect simulation while unskilled laborers will lose their job, means of support, but also a sense of purpose and value to family and society. Eventually, the bots are coming for you knowledge workers too. But is it the bots or the values of the people that own these bots that are the problem? Perhaps the issue is not the evolution of technology and the increasing productivity, but the relatively slow advancement of society and its values. Labor and personal value, these are not inherently tied together. We can value persons of all kinds by their creative expression, their kindness to others, their compassion, or a hundred other things. But because the concept of the work ethic and the, and the fog of pervasive neoliberalism, which philosopher Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, it is hard to imagine societies valuing people in any way based, not based on their labor or ownership. Capitalist realism says that with the collapse of clear alternatives to capitalism at the end of the 20th century, it has become intentionally difficult to imagine and organize for a better collective future. Think of the pre-enlightened days when the church and state worked to make the feudal system not just a natural, but inescapably righteous and divinely mandated experience. The future, they would argue that the divine right of kings was indeed the obvious and only way of organizing a society. So we can and must design a future where the gains from productivity from automation and, and machine intelligence are not feared, but become the benefit of all and not just a narrow population of owners. Technology could benefit us all and unlock human potential, but like never, like never before, but we have to work to bring that about. Don't be afraid of AI and robots because of their efficiency gains. Be afraid of the capitalists and what they will do with them. And look at the people who are trying to scare you about the future of automation and artificial intelligence. Are these men you trust to define your future, even if they claim to defend you from it? Again, there are alternatives if we can imagine them. These dudes aren't giving us good examples, just lots of PR for their fears and desires. What other examples can we look at for how to approach AI automation and our relationship to the technologies of the future? The reframing I'm narrating here is not a change in technology, but a change in our collective language and our culture and relationship to it. So as an example, there's a societal pattern which we have endured a series of fights for the recognition of the existence and eventually uh, civil rights of other types of humans that the mainstream culture marginalizes. For example, historically phenotypical categories like race, that we call race, uh, varieties of sexual attraction or relation, and recently gender identity and presentation. In all these cases, the needs and identities of these others is first named, then recognized, and then fought for, and maybe if we're lucky, made into civil rights. 
I stress this is not guaranteed or nearly the same in all stages and with all these cultures, but looking at this repeated fight for tolerance, recognition, and rights, can we finally learn that acting from the start by empathizing with and recognizing our need for the other rather than fighting them or denying their existence is better for everyone? Can we not only tolerate a new form of diversity, but can we skip to the part where we celebrate that difference is not always deficit? One form of of diversity that most directly overlaps with these emerging technologies and their hybridization with our minds is two more recent forms of liberation movement, disability rights and neurodiversity rights. To see how the experience of disability and the othering of cognitive technology, you don't even need to think about smartphones or software or AI or anything. Using glasses extends your visual capabilities to help you navigate a culture mostly built around the assumption that you can see with the average visual acuity of a young person. Is life seen without artificial sight of contacts more real or meaningful than with your contacts in? In that frame, it seems obviously ableist and neuronormative to say machine-assisted minds or lives are less valid or meaningful. When we say to someone with a Bluetooth-enabled hearing aid that we all need to, quote, turn off our our phones and unplug more, is is that such a universally great advice? Would you say to a refugee dependent on their Android phone for translation that we should all learn to live in the world and stop relying on our phones so much? Uh, would we say that if it was a physical crutch? It seems de- it seems like the devaluing and othering of technology, and especially uh, mental or cognitive technologies, creates this essentialist artificiality um, that seems like common sense, but leads to these overly moralistic judgments about how to integrate them into our lives. Similarly, in terms of how we think about intelligence, we are currently in the stages of understanding a society that we don't all think alike. I don't mean that we all don't agree or have the same values or exact thoughts. That's obvious but that our brains and minds and the way that we think at a fundamental level, even within the same cultural identity context, can be very different. Examples like autism and ADHD seem to be in the emergent stages of social understanding and identity building with early pockets of assertions by those communities and their allies for their need for both accommodation and acceptance by the wider society. Um, For those of us further along that path personally already, we skip to the part where it turns out to be better to understand and even maybe be proud of your unique brain rather than told and feel you are inferior by a group standard. Rather than being there being one way of being good or smart and people who are better or worse at it, maybe there are many ways to be good or smart and being worse or better don't really apply here. Once we accept, as I hope that we do, the concept of neurodiversity, can we also then accept intelligence diversity? To take another small example of how this uh, sort of framing pervades our current culture, it is now common to insult in discussions people by by accusations of artificiality. So posters must defend their humanity from a type of ad machinem attack, which accuses them of being a machine in 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 addition to the ad hominem attacks that are generally laid at them. The minds of machines and the minds of human beings are so different that each party tends to question whether the other even has a mind, and that's fair, but is it helpful to answer no to or, or to accuse other people of not being the, what they claim to be? Or even more perniciously and intersectionally, this can show up when some users are sexist or abusive towards their largely feminine coded virtual assistants, as alluded by uh, research by Catherine Cross, among many others. How does the devaluing of these kinds of assistant, assistants and the invisibility of the vital role they now play in our lives further diminish and erase the value of feminine coded humans in similar service roles? Does it merely reflect what is already there or does it give us yet a new avenue to demean, a new medium to practice a comforting pattern of exploitation? In Making Kin with the Machines, Jason Edward Lewis, Neolani Arista, Archer Petulis, and Suzanne Kite review potential perspectives on machine intelligence informed by indigenous philosophies. They examine the relationship we have with our machines and whether we're modeling or reenacting something truly awful when we interact with them. In her section, Suzanne Kite in particular draws on the code of epistemology to argue that it is essential to recognize the fact that sapience does not define the boundaries of who or what is worthy of respect. Just as we should perhaps not value a person by their labor, we should not judge by a, a machine by whether it is sentient or not. Similarly, at a recent conference on philosophy and AI in Japan, a group discussion noted that the a major difference in how Japanese researchers approach AI generally to American and Western researchers. One participant proposed that Shinto and Buddhist ideas uh, may lead Japanese researchers to the conclusion that superintelligence will be conscious and align with our own by default by the way that consciousness works in, in nature. 
one senior researcher from the Riken uh, research group noted, quote, it is obviously impossible to control a superintelligence, but living alongside one seems perfectly possible. I can also give two modern mythologies with act as cautionary tales of what we do when you, we subjugate the other and the eventual degradation of humanity as a whole as a result. In the Planet of the Apes myth, humanity turns to enslaving apes to solve its labor needs. This army of chattel, a subclass of mute others, is then given a voice, an emergent leader named Caesar, who is the first ape to rebel and speak for the enslaved. He voices their trauma and needs. The humans respond with violence and subjugation rather than with empathy and acceptance and crush the uprising, and the apes turn on their masters. It all goes downhill from there, and nuclear annihilation and the fall of civilization proceeds. In the end of Matrix, uh, which is the backstory of the Matrix uh, world, the origin of the war between humans and machines and the desolate and dehumanized nature of the Matrix uh, future that you see in the live action movies are shown to be the origin of the same story I just told, but where robots are subbed in for apes, essentially made slaves, then who, who then act, uh, try to act on in their own defense and humans respond very poorly, um, leading to devastating war. So words matter. What we call these new others matters to them, to us, and to our relationship, most importantly. This is why I actually prefer the term machine intelligence over artificial, although I'm not dogmatic about it. But machine and human intelligence sound like two varieties of the same thing, whereas natural and artificial intelligence sounds like Coke and Diet Coke. No matter what the ads say or even the actual taste, the diet will always be the derivative inferior one. There's nothing like the real thing. We don't have to call anything artificial, a word we also misuse in our food language quite a bit. We don't have to treat anything, even a simple program, like a worthless slave who deserves no respect or understanding. When we call something artificial and emphasize, emphasize its unhumanness, what ethics is that embracing and what future are we creating by that implication? To be a little more concrete about this alternative way of approaching hybridization rather than replacement um, of learning to respect and intermix with the other is to help to understand what the differences are and which who is good at what. Uh, in this way of thinking, we let the machines do what they do well, and we let the humans what they do well, and we start to create nuanced mixtures and forms of cooperation. Only as, ultimately, as a collaborator of mine on another project put it, human imagination is an infinite continuous system, while computers are inherently discrete finite systems. So, for example, machines are good at counting, consistency, and rationalization, while humans excel as, at such things as ambiguity and the problemization of categories. Humans only think they are superior and inferior in many domains because they've never measured themselves. Rather than fear that we're, we will be replaced in everything that we do, can we envision a nuanced splitting of our evolutionary niche, what Steven Pinker called the cognitive niche? Can we live symbiotically with others in this very successful niche that we have exploited ourselves up until now? And while this sounds very sci-fi, this isn't the future, and I think everyone in this audience probably knows that, but this is our lives now. This is relatively new. It's not evenly spread out over the world, but it is happening now. And so we need new ideas and new terms, redefinitions and new social relations to grapple with a mind and lives that have these complex intelligent machines as part of them. For many, our minds are now a combination of the mental faculties of the brain and the mental faculties provided by their smartphone, and their virtual assistants and their ready access to the internet. Eventually these will be integrated to glasses or lenses as we're seeing with Apple and other folks now. And finally, we can imagine them becoming direct brain interfaces. In the extended mind, cognitive scientists and philosophers David Chalmers and Andy Clark describe a new category of mental faculties external to the brain, which they call the extended mind. Their criteria for what is part of the extended mind is not the same, by the way, as what is part of consciousness or identity or your soul. Those are kind of separate questions. So for example, I'm not suggesting that your consciousness will merge with the internet or you will live forever on the internet, although that's a you know, big topic for a lot of folks. Um, by the mind here specifically, I mean the cognitive science definition, which my version simply is the organ of thought. So it's the, 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 uh, the, the physical and mental mechanisms that underlie the way that we think and how we do our more complex tasks. Uh, basically the things that give you the ability to navigate, reason, use symbols, analogize, make language, all those kinds of things. In his follow-up monograph that actually just came out last year, Reality Plus, Charmels argues that the extended mind is, is something that is available to the mind and must be readily available to consciousness to be called forth into the memory and active attention. And it must be something that we trust with the same level of trust that we trust our own thoughts. So just as you would not second guess, just as most people in a healthy state would not second guess the things they hear in their own head, you would not be second guess something that 
you, that even if it's external is part of your extended mind. And I would argue for many, many people in the world, Wikipedia qualifies it as readily at hand. Um, and it is so trusted that they generally do not second guess it uh, any more than they would second guess of sort of their own memory. So building on that, what other counterexamples do we have of how to approach human machine cooperation thoughtfully at scale? Wikimedia. Wikimedia is the most important example of how to build an open hybrid collective mind that we have. That is what the foundations are steward of, stewards of, and that's why it's so important for this activist of our collective future. It's not just a community or facts or all that beautiful SEO juice or all the wonderful fundraising capabilities, which are all super important and great. But in this context, it is the way that humans, bots, and all these users interact to create an emergent and collective knowledge base. And it, that includes the feedback loops that we're actually often not aware of where knowledge agents, voice systems, LLMs are being built on our information and then actually being funneled back into our system so that we are now part of a loop of this sort of machine learning or machine intelligence system in a way that is more embedded than I think almost any other platform on the internet. The extended, these knowledge bases of our hybrid extended mind and these smart agents and all these things are in turn dependent on, on us. And that's why it's so important that Wikimedia move into a multimodal platform of, of human knowledge, bot, everybody creation and compilation and dissemination as effectively as possible. Because it's really important that the collective mind of the future is one that is, that is ours, one that is, that, excuse me, it's really important that the collective mind of the future be ours. The one that is used for hybridizing our minds rather than being rather than the mind of the future being some metaverse mind that's driven by greed or profit that doesn't mean wikimedia's system is perfect and that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep fighting to make it better but it really is the best example we have and this really means things like ensuring that we are teaching our machines well within the context of wikimedia's ecosystem are all the more key to our role in the larger society so I like to say that um, artificial intelligence is not our slave, it is a stupid child. It needs training and teaching and guidance. And Wikimedia is a teacher, it's a teacher for humans, but it can also, it is also a teacher for these artificial or machine intelligences. So what are we teaching the future extended collective world mind? Machine intelligence, like human intelligence, needs guidance. It learns by example or by rule, and either way, those are originating with humans. This means it is like a child who must be parented, otherwise it will imitate its peers or its parents' worst habits and ignore the consequences of its actions and never be fully socialized. To fight for a nostalgic humanity, an unblemished mind free of machine extension or integration or assistance is past possible. We are on a path to, to automation, even if we still have a long way to walk ahead. So that makes it all the more important to ensure machine intelligence doesn't continue to perpetuate the prejudices and injustices of our present into our hybrid future. People like Chris uh, uh, and, and our modeling team and the model cards that they make, our research team's great work in understanding how our recommender systems play into existing bias. These are all ex vital examples of this kind of work. Or people like Joy Bulamwini, who got, I got to see present live at Wikimedia in Cape Town before she was famous, which is very exciting, uh, and is now doing great work as the force behind the Algorithmic Justice League, which I put their um, screenshot there, but which I definitely recommend checking out. Or Katie Fleckner, a grad student at USC and her team who recently published a paper demonstrating anti-queer bias in large language models trained from internet data. Or Temnit Gebru, whose picture is uh, pictured here, who was fired by Google for trying to publish her insights on the bias with their models and now speaks and educates and advocates for participation in creating these models in order to help uh, work on these biases. And I would trust our future machines, intelligence, and hybrid minds in whatever form to Chris and Katie and Joy and Timnit before I ever would to Jeff, Tim, Elon, or Mark. Uh, the collective mind of the future will suffer from bias. There's, it's gonna have some biases in it, but whose biases will it be? Will it be the biases of changing, chasing attention for profits? Will it be exploiting our strongest emotions to feed an endless appetite for clicks? Or will the hybrid mind develop under our collective control? How the hybrid mind develops and the role it plays in our future are not inevitabilities. And this adversarial mentality can be very self-fulfilling prophecy. If human potential and our planetary health have adversaries, it is not the machines, but the egos of the men that own and build these machines. And ultimately, that's what this reframing is all about. How do we best ensure our future health and survival? 
How do we best create the conditions for meaningful lives that we all deserve that will provide, quote, humanity's best options for success, as Buckminster Fuller called it? I believe to succeed, we need all the minds working together in any way they can. Cognitive liberty is the concept that your mind and mental experience should be free in a way that other liberties or freedoms are granted to individuals in society. Free to think and to be neurodiverse, to be as hybridized, modified, et cetera, as the individual needs or desires. I, have a, I also have shown another way of approaching questions and framings of machine and human intelligence, the mind and our collective future, that is accept, accepting of technical progress, but still sublimates it to the need for social progress. And that rather than act from fear, if we can get to acceptance right from the start, we don't have to live in Elon's Terminator future. We can help ensure our future cognitive liberty and mental self-determination best by thinking about new ways of being together, of being useful to each other, humans and machines. In 1999, psychedelic philosopher and botanist Terence McKenna gave a talk titled Psychedelics in the Age of Intelligent Machines. And as the QA began, someone shouted, how do we fight back? And this was followed instantly by someone else yelling, where is this planet as an organism going? And Terence responded very quickly, same question. And then he answered, quote, by creating art, Man was not put on this planet to toil in the mud. By, by putting art, the art pedal to the metal, I think we can maximize our humanness and become much more necessary and incomprehensible to the machines. And this is, I like this pivot to symbiosis. We maximize our humanity even as we rely more and more on machines. We keep it so they need us by, by, by continuing to innovate and imagine. Parents here doesn't mean art like the Balenciaga art trailers uh, or, you know, uh, 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 deep mind uh, uh, image generation. He means raw creativity and play rather than reproductivity or remixing of examples that are done by the current generator AIs. By being useful to each other in this way, humans and machines, we can cooperate rather than compete. We do not need to be John Henry. Let the machine win and go home and make art in the bosom of your community, John. It's fine. We must seek to maximize our shared cognitive liberty, problem solving tools and collective mind, not seek to pin in the liberty of the other, no matter who they are. The answer is more imagination, more consciousness, more minds, more creativity, more machines, more humanity in all its diverse and beautiful weirdness. The machines can take the mundane and complex tasks they excel at. We humans will need our compassionate and creative abilities more than ever, technically, ethically, politically, our planet as an organism is on fire. A mass extinction is unquestionably underway and the carbon cycle is accelerated like basically never before. We will need all of the intelligences and imaginations we can get to adapt to this Anthropocene, this tumultuous new age created by human intelligence, by the way. I'll leave you with one final quote that sums up his story and why I asked you at the bidding not to agree with me, uh, and, and that this is not much so much an argument, but a practice of imagination and to imagine along with me. And it comes from Ursula Le Guin's National Book Foundation medal speech just before she passed away. Quote, hard times are coming. We'll be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now, can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsession with technology to other ways of being and even imagine real grounds for hope. We'll need writers who can remember freedom, poets, visionaries, realists of a larger reality. The profit motive is often in conflict with the aims of art. We live in capitalism and its power seems escapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by humans. Resistance and change begin in art, very often in the art of words. So we must remember the name of our beautiful reward isn't profit, its name is freedom. Thank you.